Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tola Ajayi, and I want to welcome you to um, Nordica Fertility Center, welcoming you to the continuous um, professional development um, webinar for nurses. Um, we do this regularly uh, with our nurses, with nurses all over the world, we do this. And um, for COVID, um, it has given us the opportunity to, to do this um, online. And I think, and I, and I want to agree that it's better. <laughs> um, I don't know, can you hear me? Let me just cross check. Okay. Um, so like I said, my name is Tola Jai. I'm the clinic manager for Nordica Fertility Center Lagos. And I also serve as um, a fertility, a sex and relationship counselor. Um, yes, so I welcome you all. To all our attendees, um, I wish you a very pleasant evening. And to our um, panelists, I uh, say thank you for taking this on. Um, today, we are going to talk on pre-genetic diagnosis and pre-genetic um, um, selection and their uses in family balancing and also taking care of genetic abnormalities. So we are talking about PGD and we are talking about PGS. So we're going to know the meaning of each and of course the difference of um, between um, the PGD and PGS. And I uh, want to say that I have um, um, a group of women, <laughs> a group of women. I don't know why <laughs> nurses are synonymous with women. We, of course, we know we have some men. I, I know that we even have some online now. So I'm going to introduce our panelists for tonight. Um, I have um, the first person to be speaking to us on the PGD, and that is uh, Victoria Jeff Eboy. Victoria Jeff Eboy. Um, has been a nurse for about 11 years. She finished from the University of Benin Teaching Hospital in Edo State, and um, she's a fertility nurse. She's, she's a mother, and um, she also believes that, uh, um, she strongly believes that every woman ought to experience the joy of motherhood. So you're welcome, it's Victoria Jeffy Boy. Thank you for doing this with us. Um, I also have with us tonight, um, Mrs. Inenna Okoro Dixin. Inenna is a versatile professional with five years of rich experience as um, a qualified registered nurse midwife. She's also a public health nurse and um, also a graduate nurse with a proven record of excellent client relationship and delivery of high quality services. Hmm. Tongue twisting, um... <laughs> okay. And also she's trained and um, um, satisfied in healthcare project management and quality management systems for healthcare professionals. Um, Nena also is a fertility nurse. Uh, welcome Nena to this webinar tonight. I, um, so these are the two people that will be sharing their experience on PGD and PGS, but we also have two other people who will be joining us. Um, Baby Sola Ujo Adekule is, um, she's a gynae endoscopy um, coordinator and also a fertility nurse with Nordica Fertility Center. Uh, Baby completed her nursing and medical education at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital with Diaraba. Um, she started her career as a fertility nurse in 2007 with Nordica Fertility Center when she joined as a trainee um, fertility nurse then and rose to the position of a clinic coordinator today. She heads the endoscopy units at the Nordica Center, where she has assisted in over 4,000 endoscopy surgeries. Um, she had a basic training in obstetric, gynecology, ultrasound scan at Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia, USA, and also cosmetic surgery at Pelosi Medical Center, New Jersey, USA. She's a member of the Association of Fertility and Reproductive Health Nigeria, that's AFRH, and uh, she's also a member of the European Society of Human Reproductive and Embryology, that's ESHRI. She's a good trainer when it comes to educating nurses in fertility, endoscopy, and the like. She has a high standard of professionalism and understanding. Welcome, Bimi, to this webinar tonight. Um, 
Also, I have um, Ade Damilola Atiba. Ade Damilola Atiba is a senior clinical embryologist with Nordica Fertility Center, Lagos, where she also heads the genetic unit. Um, she has a BSc in cell biology and genetics from the University of Lagos, um, Nigeria, and a master degree in clinical embryology from the University of Leeds, United Kingdom. She has undergone various training in pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and vitrification at the University College Hospital London, University College London, UK, and in Spain, Europe. Um, she has co-authored many medical publications and delivered numerous lectures in various conferences across Nigeria. The member of the Association of Fertility and uh, Reproductive Health, that's AFR Rich Nigeria, and also a member of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, ASRM, and the American College of Embryology, ACE. Welcome, Damilola, to this um, uh, webinar tonight. Um, yes, we have. Uh, are you still hear me? Yes, well, we can hear you, ma. Okay, thank you. So tonight, like I said, it's a continuous professional development webinar for nurses, and um, I welcome you all to this program. My name is Tola Jai, and um, I'm handing over to Victoria to take us on PGD. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, ma. Good afternoon, all. I join voice to welcome everybody. My name is Victoria Jeff Iboi. Today we'll be looking at PGD and um, the services that we render here in Nordica Fertility Center, how we can affect the world and uh, this, how the service can be of benefit to everyone. So I welcome you all to this presentation. As I say, great nurses to all. It's our nurses week and uh, we are known for pro high professionalism. So I will just wait a few moments for the slides to come up, please. Okay, while we wait for the slides, let's go over a um, brief overview on genetic inheritance. Genetic inheritance is um, what we inherit from our parents as children. We get some of our parents' traits and that tells us how we behave and the way we are, what makes our genetic makeup. This is our genetic traits and with which we get we got from our parents. So in the form of development, Victoria, we can't hear you again. Now we can see your slide, but we cannot hear you. Hello, Victoria.
Hello, good afternoon, all. Sorry for that um, little technical error. So we have been the slides being shared from our Lagos office. I'm actually talking to you now from our server office. So next slide, please, Mr. Wale. So we'll be going through this outline, a brief overview on genetic inheritance, what is PGT, what is PGD, who should consider PGD, benefits of PGD, we'll discuss the limitations and then we'll conclude. As I was even saying earlier, a brief overview of genetic inheritance is um, genetic inheritance is what the mat genetic materials we got from our parents. So it is being transferred from parents to offsprings. And this is a form of DNA. And uh, it's actually what makes us who we are, how we behave, our make and, and general makeup. That we inherited them from our parents. Then there are, there are what we call genes and DNA. I would like in genes to be the alphabetical letters. We have A to Z. So letters put together form words. So that is what I would like in to be G DNA for the purpose of this presentation. We we'll let's cast our minds to when we are learning our ABCs. So these are the genes. Then DNA are collection of uh, genes put together to form DNA and chains of DNAs come together to form what we call chromosomes. So naturally they should, they have a way that it should be arranged. Like you, if you want to spell Victoria now, it is V-I-C-T-O-R-O-I-A. It will be another word if you rearrange them. It will not make sense anymore. So if there is anything, any error in the arrangement, there is what we call Mutations. Next slide, please. So when there is an error on how this genetic material should be arranged, that is called mutation. So it could be as a result of how it's been copied when they are being, uh, for the cells are being divided, when the, the, the error could occur from there or exposed to environmental factors, maybe cigarette smoking or radiations. That has to do with when the woman is pregnant. So there could be an alteration in the genetic makeup, that is the DNA or the, in the genes. So there are various forms. If you look at this picture, please play that picture again. If you look at this picture, you will see where the mutation or call instead of a instead of C C T A, it is now C G T. So that means mutation. The C was not changed to G. So there's an error there. So that will automatically give rise to an abnormal um, embryo or a, an abnormal child. So the reason why we do genetic screening in Nordica Fertility Center is to, rem is to rule out any uh, deformity or any chromosomal abnormalities from a child. So if you look at this screen now, you see the first series are all mutated DNA. So mutations can actually be substitution if a word, instead of this, if you look at the second one, you see C, A being substituted for C. So that is an error. The next one is insertion, an extra C was insected. The next one is deletion, a letter was being deleted, or invaction, instead of C, C, A, it is not A, T, C. So these are various forms of errors. These are various forms of mutations. So now that will bring us to what we do here at Nordica, which is pre-implantation genetic testing. Basically, 
pre-implantation genetic testing, as the name implies, it is screening embryos at the stage before they have been transferred, the pre-implantation stage before they have been transferred. You are screening for a, a genetic disease or chromosomal abnormalities or disorder before you transfer these embryos to the mother. So note that PGT is done in conjunction with IVF. And we have two types of PGT. We have PGD, next slide please. We have PGD and PGS. For PGS, I will be leaving that for my colleague Nena to discuss more on PGS. So I'll be focusing more on PGD. Where P, for PGD, we are looking at a known genetic disorder. There's already a, a family history of an abnormality, a genetic disease, something like cystic fibrosis or X-linked disease or sickle cell disease. There's already a known family history of that disease. So we are looking at those genes responsible for that and screening the embryo for that. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is a technique which is used in conjunction with IVF. IVF simply means in vitro fertilization. So we analyze the embryo that we get from IVF and screen them out from and those known genetic disorders like I talked about. So it is the embryos that are free from these genetic diseases or defects that will not be transferred, that are stable for transfer. So the process of PG defects will go through ovarian stimulation. What this means is that we give the woman drugs to produce more eggs, you know, naturally, only one egg matured and ovulates. So we take chances of the many antra follicles that have been recruited for that month. We give these women stimulation drugs to produce more eggs. The eggs have been monitored and then harvested as egg oocytes pick up or aspiration. They have been fertilized and cultured for five days. Basically, we can get day three biopsy, but the one that is suitable right now is the day five biopsy, where it gives us more chance to examine more cells. There are more cells to be, to be examined. Next slide, please. So this is still talking about the process of uh, PGD. The eggs have been collected, fertilized, cultured, Biopsy is taken and analysis will be done. So currently the, the, this, the technique that is being used now, it is called next generation sequencing that gives us the, the opportunity to screen the entire embryo. So the results are being reviewed and the unaffected embryos are transferred, then it gives rise to genetically normal baby. Next slide, please. So who should actually consider PGD? Like I mentioned earlier, PGD screens for a known family history of genetic disorder. So when there is a family history of a known genetic disease, those couples should think of PGD or couple who are currently having a genetic disease like the sickle cell disease or X-linked disease like the hemophilia or color blindness. So these are people with history of health. This form of history should, should be thinking of doing PGD. It can also be done for severe sibling for HLA matching. That is, if a couple has a dying child or child that is having a disease, maybe they need a stem cell transplant, 
So they can actually go through PGD to get a donor, a sibling that matches with them, that they will use the stem cell to make the other child live. So PGD is also indicated for such a couple. PGD is av uh, available for most inherited conditions for which the exact mutation is known. And then people seeking for PGD treatment, sometimes they are fertile couple, they are not having issues with fertility. But occasionally we, see, we also see some couples who present at the clinic for fertility management works will catch, will get to know that uh, they will need PGD treatment. Like okay, by the time we not do the assessment, we'll find out that they are both ASAS. So we'll be recommending PGD for genotype selection. So those couples have fertility challenge already, and then they have been picked to do PGD. But most of the time, people that seek for PGD technologies, they are fertile couple. So we'll look, we'll look at this um, slide carefully. When you see, if you look at this slide, you see a mother who is having a who is a carrier and a father who is normal. By the time they they give birth to children, one out of the four the, the four children they will have will be affected with the disease. One will be a carrier and two will be unaffected. That is for X-linked disease. Then for the ASAS couple, the, what happens to their red blood cell, normally if you look at this slide, normally the, the sequence should be as the first one is. But when there is mutation, there's a change from a particular protein, if you look at the place that is showing red, the protein there has been changed to another protein. So that will give rise to a sickle cell. So when there's that change, that when there's that mutation, there's already a problem. So with PGD, we can screen for that. Let's look at this picture that shows us, okay, an AS couple, Get a, a, an AS man getting married to an AS woman. There is always a 25% chance of every pregnancy that she, that woman carry to be AS, to be SS, and a 50% chance to be AA. So now let's look at the benefit of PGD. PGD can help to eliminate some genetic dis diseases, like I mentioned earlier, that it causes lacking to not, not to be found soon. So PGD is available for such um, diagnosis for such diseases, and also it reduces the possibility of having to choose to terminate pregnancy following a diagnosis of fetus with probable genetic dis disorder. Imagine a woman that has been pregnant for two, three months. She has already bonded to that pregnancy. And she goes for examination or scan one day and a doctor is telling her that this child is having a disease that is not compatible to life. She needs to go through that emotional stress of terminating pregnancy. So we, if, if that couple has to go through PGD, that stress, that uh, trauma will not be there. But of course, we have some limitations to PGD. It is capital in, intensive. It needs, we need multiple cycles to get no, good numbers of embryos to analyze. There's also that possibility of not having a suitable result whereby we're not having transferred. The, the result might come back, come back that all the embryos are affected. So that is a possibility. Possibility of a mosaicism, 
that is a cell, a, a particular embryo having two distinct cells. You can't actually tell if it's normal or abnormal. PGD can only detect a specific genetic disease in an embryo. It cannot detect many, many genetic disease, disease at the same time. So that is a limitation that we screen for AS, SS, and AA does not guarantee that the child might not have other genetic diseases. So that is limitation right now. As we know, science is evolving. There's also damage to the embryo, which is projected to be 0.1%. 0, 0 so that is why you need to choose Nordica Fertility Center when you are thinking about referring a client to do PGD treatment, or if you are even thinking of doing PGD yourself. So you should think of Nordica because we have our accuracy rate of over 99.9%. So there are other alternatives to PGD, which is conceived naturally and do what we call prenatal diagnosis. We have the unity test for that. Unity test can be done for women from a 10th week of pregnancy while screening for genetic disorders. But like I said, the woman will also need to go through that emotional stress of, should I terminate it or not? So there's plus or minus termination of pregnancy, or maybe consider the use of donor garments. Like I said earlier, science is evolving. So the future for PGD, we're actually hoping that in the nearest future, PGD, there will be genetic links for some diseases that run in the family, like for diabetes, for hypertension, for cardiovascular diseases, even for endometriosis, which we are champion, championing the campaign awareness on endometriosis, that one of these days science might break through to get to have a PGD treatment for endometriosis, where we will now screen for probable um, embryos that might be af affected then PGD holds a great promise for the future for techniques and genetic tests are perfected. PGD may become a common uh, option for all. Like, oh, I don't want to just have any issues with my child later. So you can do PGD to screen out any abno genetic abnormalities. In conclusion, the development of PGD is one of the most exciting and important milestones in history of AROT, which is assisted reproductive technology. PGD is a reliable procedure in preventing the birth defects in children that affect children, which I said our accuracy rate is over 99.9%. So I will encourage you to choose Nordica Fertility Center when you are thinking of PGD. Genetic diseases cannot be cured, but it can be prevented. Hence, the importance of PGD in IVF. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Victoria. That, that was um, a nice presentation. Um, and I believe that um, the people who are listening are also taking notes. And um, I want to remind us, please, if you have any question, just go to the uh, Q&A section and just um, put in your question. I think it's better for us to take all the questions after the two presentations, because we have other people as uh, panelists that, uh, that can also answer some of the questions. So if you have any question, go to the Q&A and drop your question. Um, just a quick reminder from what she has said, uh, with uh, PGD, you have to do IVF before you can do PGD. And, um, we should not also forget that uh, for people who have um, um, maybe your friends or you have patients who are ASAS and they're considering, because sometimes I see people and they know from the get-go that, okay, I'm AS, she's AS, um, but we have to get married. 
we have to get married for reasons best known to them. Even though sometimes when you talk to them about the, um, the possibilities of having um, SS um, children, but they still want to go ahead and get married, you cannot deny them since technology can take care of, of that uh, problem. So we can introduce the PGD to them for, because we also know that um, ASAS SS problem is a, is a major problem in our society in this part of the world. So that can also be taken care of through technology. So, um, let me welcome um, Nena Okoro Dixin to take us through PGS. Uh, then we can now ask our questions. The other panelists also can also join us in answering some of the questions. Thank you, Victor. Um, Nena, welcome. Nena Okoro Dixin, are you there? That's one problem that we still have to battle with in Nigeria with our network. So we just hope that um, it will come from um, Well, maybe we should just take some questions while we're waiting. Um, okay. Please, um, Immaculate Clement just asked a question. Please, can AS marry um, SS? Can AS marry SS so they go for PGD? Hmm, I don't know what that question means. Um, can AS marry SS so they go for PGD? Um, okay, Victoria, you want to answer that? Can AS marry SS? Yeah. Yes, they can. They can. So they can also go for PGD to screen the uh, embryos so that they will have genetically normal babies free from SS. Anyway, what, what, what the, the couple can have is, um, if, even if you screen, they can have AS. There is no AA in their situation because of the other person that has started SS. So they can go for PGD. Yeah. Um, that's a immaculate. While we are waiting for Nena, um, let me take this question from Ayola Badijo. Um, Am I right in assuming that Down syndrome is not detected through PGD? No mention of Down syndrome um, among the genetic um, abnormalities mentioned. Um, maybe I should call Damilola to help us in, in this um, question. And Damilola just take us through this. Ayola Badijo asks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to celebrate the nurses first. Concerning that question, I think um, that's what Inina is going to be taking, so I won't go too much into it. After okay. Inina's question, so if we have any further questions, then we can address it. Good, thank you. Um, Akwaja Cynthia asked, can I get the definition of PGD? I was late for the meeting. PGD, definition for PGD, Victoria. PGD is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, 
This is done to screen the embryo from any genetic abnormalities. Like I mentioned before, SS, you are screening for SS, that is people with already known genetic disorder, like they are both ASAS or ASSS, like somebody asked, or there's a family history of an X-linked disease. So you are doing PGD, that is, PGD simply is an acronym that means pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Okay, um, Victoria- I don't know if I answer your question, please. Maybe she will let us know if she's still in doubt. Um, that's a Cynthia. If you are not clear, please let us know. Um, Victoria Agubama says, um, does it mean that even if the couples have multiple embryos, only one genetic um, issue can be tested? Um, can Dami just take that? Can the Dami dollar take that with us? Does it mean that even if the couples have multiple embryos, only one genetic um, issue can be tested? Yes, um, from that question, because the way the process is, we can only screen for one disease at the same time. So except we have situations where we take enough genetic material from each embryo, and then we say we are screening, for example, we are screening the embryos for sickle cell as well as albinism, for example. So th those are two things that we can look for. But um, we, there's a limitation. We cannot screen for all the things that could be wrong because there are a lot of things that could be wrong um, at the same time. So that's, that's, that's just what that, what that is trying to explain. All right. Um, we're still waiting for Nena. Please let, let us know if Nena is ready for us. That we don't we don't take too much time asking questions, and while the other presentation is still pending. Good afternoon, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm ready. Sorry about the internet challenge, but we've been able to sort it out. So I'll be taking us on pre-implantation genetic screening. Thankfully, somebody has already asked a question in that line. So I'm hoping that this presentation should be able to enlighten us better and probably answer that question. So my name is Nena Oko, and this is the outline I'll be using for my presentation. We'll be talking about, the, we'll be having an introduction, talking about the aim, the definition, indications, the process, the possible results, the advantages, disadvantages, the role of genetic counseling, and then we'll conclude. As a matter of introduction, I'd like to say that it's a desire of virtually every family to have a healthy baby. For most couples, this has been more of a dream than a reality because they are either battling with infertility or recurrent pregnancy losses. For a long time, there was neither knowledge of the root cause of such issues or a, sol or a solution in view for people in these situations. However, with the invention of early pre-implantation tests like PGS, many stories have changed for good. I'll be elaborating on that shortly. So what's the aim of this presentation? I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, we would have gotten enough information for ourselves and even as nurses, because we have a lot of interaction with different clients uh, in our gynae worlds, in female medical worlds, even at our social gatherings, we have a lot of interactions with people and they trust us to give them certain relevant information. So when we meet couples that need this screening, we should be able to be equipped with enough information for them. So I'm hoping that this presentation should be able to do that. So what is pre-implantation genetic screening? It's a kind of genetic study that is used with in an IVF cycle to screen embryos for any chromosomal abnormalities before transferring the embryos back into the uterus. So in PGS, what are we checking? We want to be sure that all the 23 pairs of chromosomes are present in that embryo and we want to be 
so that they are all normal. There's no deviation from normal. So in PGS, we are screening for all the 23 pairs of chromosomes, including the two sets of chromosomes X and Y. And we are also checking to be sure that they are all normal before we transfer that embryo back into the uterus of the woman. Um, before we proceed into PGS, I just want to do an over PGS, sorry, I just want to do an overview on chromosomes. Chromosomes are thread-like structures located in the nucleus of animal and plant cells. Now, each chromosome is made up of a protein and a single molecule of deoxyribonucleic acid, that's the DNA. Now, DNA is what carries specific instructions that make us unique, and these are the instructions that can be passed from parents to offspring. That's why you see a light-skinned mother can give birth to a light-skinned baby, or a tall father can give birth to a tall child. That's why when we see a, if a child not looking like the mother or the father, you see people ordering for DNA or paternity tests. So DNA carries those kind of unique information. Now, each human cell should contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, including the X and Y sex chromosome, making 46 in total. So in PGS, we are checking that the chromosomes are 46 as they should be, and they are all normal in pairs. I'll be elaborating on that shortly. Now, but sometimes errors can occur either in the egg or in the sperm that can result in either a missing chromosome or an extra chromosome. So instead of having a pair, we're having one chromosome, or instead of having a pair, we're having three chromosomes. Now, any of those kind of deviation is what we refer to as aneuploidy or abnormality. Now, in women, what are some of the things that can cause this kind of errors? Mostly, it's age-related. But in sperm, it's mostly lifestyle-related. Maybe there's excessive smoking or alcohol consumption, or the man is exposed excessively to radioactive compounds like lead, petrochemicals, you know, it can cause errors in the sperm that will reflect in the chromosomes. Now, PGS plays an important role in identifying these deviations. So who needs or who requires pre-implantation genetic screening? Women above the age of 35. Studies have shown that as a woman's age is increasing, the rate of abnormality in the chromosome is also increasing. From the bar chart on the screen, we can see that women less than 35 years old, they have about maybe like 15% of abnormalities in their embryo. But look at the numbers for women 38 to 40 years old. We have almost 50%. So almost 50% of the embryo women that are 38 to 40 who make will be abnormal. Now for women above 40, we can see the numbers go up to almost 70%. 70% of abnormal embryos. That's why PGS is recommended for any woman that is trying to conceive from ages 35 and above. Another category of people that will really benefit from PGS is women that have had more than two miscarriages. So a woman says that every time she gets pregnant in the first 12 weeks, she has lost the, the pregnancy. Chromosomal abnormalities have been said to contribute to about 70% of early pregnancy losses. So it's possible that those embryos are abnormal and that's why they are not implanting or even when they implant, they don't grow as they should and it results in a pregnancy loss. Then considering people, then another set of women that could benefit from this technology is women that, are, that had multiple failed IVF. So a woman is undergoing IVF and she has done her test and everything is normal. All the right protocols have been put in place and she does embryo transfer. And every single time the, the, the treatment is unsuccessful. And when she comes for a review, she's told this implantation failure. Most implantation failures have been associated with abnormalities in the embryos that were transferred. But if PGS is used to screen such embryos, we can reduce that chance of implantation failure. Now, when a woman also have had a previous pregnancy with a chromosomal problem, let's say a woman has been pregnant before and she delivered a Down syndrome baby, instead of taking the risk and having another Down syndrome baby, it's better such a woman 
undergoes PGS so that we can strain those embryos out and transfer the healthy embryos. Then PGS can also be used for family balancing because when we're screening the, for the um, chromosomes that are present, we also check for the X, the sex chromosomes, the X and Y sex chromosomes. So we are able to tell if the baby is a girl or a boy. This would be beneficial for families where they already have three baby girls and they want a boy, or they have five baby boys and they want a girl. Even though in, in, in this society now, people are not having that many children, or you don't have one, and you want to make sure that the other one is the other gender. You have a girl, you don't want to have more than two babies. I want to be sure that the next one you're going to have is a boy. You can also use PGS for that kind of situation. Now, what is the process of PGS? It, it, it also goes with IVF just like PGD. PGS is always done alongside IVF. So we have to do IVF to be able to create the embryos where we'll be taking the biopsy from. So and we need the more the number of embryos we have, the better because this is a, a should I use the word gain of probability? The more embryos you have, the more the chances of having normal embryos with all the normal chromosomes present. And the embryos we use are D5 embryos. From the diagram on the screen, you can see the embryos are at different stages of development. The biopsy is better collected from the D5 embryos because they have more cells and they are more defined with an inner mass and an outer shell. Because the biopsy is usually taken from the outer shell of the embryo, which is the trophectodem that eventually becomes the placenta. So we do not touch the inner mass that becomes the baby. So there's no question of, oh, we're going to damage the baby or hurt the baby or harm the baby. The cells are collected from the outer shell, which becomes the placenta, but also contains the, the same components as the inner mass that becomes the baby. So when we collect those, that sample, with those samples are sent to the lab. So it's not the whole embryo that is sent for analysis. The embryo is safely frozen in the lab while we send the biopsy for analysis. Usually genetic analysis takes three to four weeks for the result to come back. And then the result is reviewed with the couple. And then the normal embryos, the recommended number of the normal embryos, by normal we mean embryos that have the correct number of chromosomes and there's no deviation from normal. That's what we eventually transfer back into the uterus of the woman. Now, what are some of the possible results we can get from PGS? The woman has been stimulated. We've gotten the number of embryos that we want. We have sent it for analysis. What are some of the results that can come back to us? Number one, we can have normal embryos, which means that the 23 pairs of chromosomes are present and they are in pairs as they should be. There's no extra chromosome here and there. There's no, no, there's no missing chromosome here. And they are all complete as they should be. That's normal embryos. It can, the results can also come back to tell us the gender of the baby, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's a male or a female baby. Then we can have a monosomy. This is a condition where instead of a pair, we have single copies of the chromosome. An example of such a syndrome is Turner syndrome. So we see the, the child is usually not normal. They will have low, low sitting ears, white chairs. They are prone to infertility, cardiac problems to be able to identify them, short and wide neck. These are some of the features that they have. These children that have just one copy of chromosome rather than a pair. Another um, result that can come back from a PGS analysis is Down syndrome. This is uh, like the most common of them, occurs in one in 700 babies. I'm sure we have all come in contact with some of these children that have a, a moon-shaped face, flat nose, small eyes, you know, um, club mental slowness in their mental abilities. These are some of the features of down syndrome and babies that's trisomy 21 so there are three copies of the of the chromosome 21 rather than two so and this is the most compatible with life that's why we get to see a, a lot of it unlike the edward syndrome and the patois syndrome edward syndrome is the trisomy 18 
is usually most of the it occurs in like one in every six thousand to eight thousand babies. And before thirty days of their life, many of them pass on because there's congenital heart defects, growth retardation, a cleft, facial cleft, spinal bifida, you know, to mention a few. So other possible results that can come back from a PGS screening, we have Klinefelter syndrome, where a male is born with an extra copy of the X sex chromosome. So a, a male, instead of having XY, has XXY. And then we have the XYY syndrome, where a male, instead of having just XY, has XYY. Then we have the triple X syndrome, where the female has three X sex chromosome instead of two. And then we have the mosaic syndrome where there's a mixture of normal and abnormal cells. And then sometimes the quality of the embryo is so poor that it cannot be analyzed. So it comes back as no result. So what are some of the advantages of PGS? Like my colleague said, there is a very precise technology. We have 98 to 99 0.9% accuracy in determining if this embryo is abnormal or not. It also reduces the risk of miscarriages because if abnormality is responsible for implantation failure, then or, or arresting the growth of the embryos, when we have screened and we have known that this embryo is normal and we transfer into the uterus, it reduces the risk of miscarriages, it increases the pregnancy rate, and it also improves the chances of having a healthy baby. So not, not only is the pregnancy going to be healthy, the baby that is born is also going to be healthy. But PGS, as much as it has advantages, it also has this um, or limitations. Limitations, one of it is it can be time demanding because first of all, the woman has to go through IVF. Then when we've gotten the number of embryos that we need, the samples are sent out for analysis, which takes about four weeks. And then when, when the samples are, when the results are back, the woman's womb has to be prepared again for the frozen embryo transfer. So it can take a longer period of time. It also involves some costs, the cost for the IVF, the cost for the analysis, and the cost for the frozen embryo transfer. It can also be emotionally and psychologically strenuous. In the, during the IVF cycles, the couples have to take permission from work to go to the clinic separately for monitoring, the long waits, waiting for the results, and sometimes the results do not come back favorable. You know, so the hope and all of so this can be some of the limitations of um, PGS. And also, it cannot be used in natural conception because the embryos have to be created, analyzed before transferred into the back into the uterus. So, for a woman that has conceived naturally, she will not be able to benefit from PGS. But all hope is not lost because there's. Um, science is always evolving and there's a non-invasive fetal trisomy test called NIFTY where blood sample is taken from the mother from week 10. At that point, it's believed that free DNA from the fetus is already circulating in the mother's blood. So if we get that sample, we are able to analyze for abnormal chromosomes and we can be able to detect for conditions like Down syndrome from week 10 of pregnancy and above. It can, this same test can also be used to assess if the baby is a boy or a girl. So now from what we've discussed so far, we can see that sometimes um, PGS results can come back un unfavorable or say a woman is already pregnant and she does a nifty test and finds out that she has, she's carrying a Down syndrome baby. If such a couple do not go through counseling, it may be a very difficult thing for them to be able to accept. So the role of genetic counseling cannot be overemphasized, as during the PGS process, a lot of time, emotions, and finances is committed. Unfavorably, res unfavorable results can tip parties into depression, denial, or paranoia. So at every point in time during the PGS process, decisions are taken, before, during, after. So 
the couple always need enough information. They need to understand the implication of every decision that they take. So this always goes with genetic counseling, which we also offer in Nordica, because you can't do PGS without counseling, so that at every stage the couples are, are carried out along so uh, in the end they can come to terms with all the possible outcome of the entire process so in conclusion with accuracy of 98 to 99 percent of determining the presence of unemployed in an embryo thereby adding to the success rate of healthy pregnancy and baby pgs is a welcome solution for couples who are trying to conceive and at greater risk of having a favorable outcome. So right now, where technology is, we, we can do a lot. We can do a lot. People don't have to be stuck with um, family problems of always having a miscarriage, or people don't have to always deal with, because it's really challenging raising a child that has some chromosomal abnormalities. So technology has been put in place to be able to mitigate mitigate against these things. So it's important for us as nurses, as great and vibrant nurses, to be able to educate our friends, our family, our co-workers, our patients, you know, arm them with this information that can help them balance and complete their families. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nena. Thank you, that, that, was, that was a great presentation. Um, yeah. We, this is a um, question and answer um, section, and we already have some questions typed out at the Q&A section. So I'm just going to read out some. Um, someone says, can PGD be done for natural conception since, since it is done with IVF and before implantation? And PGD be done for natural conception. Benny, are you there? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like the like the question said that it can be done with with natural conception. Once you've gotten pregnant, you're no more doing PGD because PGD means pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. That means we want to diagnose something before we even transfer the, preg the embryo into the womb. So it's either you are doing PGD, or you are doing another thing we call either NIFT or UNITY, which is when you now collect the sample from the mother from 10 weeks and screen for whatever you want to screen for. Victoria actually mentioned that mm -hmm. because for some people, for some reasons, they may not be able to do the PGD, whether because of finance and all that, and if you if you get pregnant spontaneously and um, you have a concern, then you take your blood sample by um, ten weeks of pregnancy. And Victoria mentioned that in her presentation. Um, so let's go on. Um, please, ma, can PGD be done? Okay, that's then. Um, Adiola says, what about if genetic abnormality is detected? What will be done? How is it different from termination of pregnancy? Nena. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. And PGD, okay. Um, what about if genetic abnormality is detected? What will be done? So if there is an abnormality when you when you do PGD, how is it different from termination of pregnancy? Because I, I, I came back to you because you mentioned genetic counseling. Yes. To answer that. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the results come back with abnormalities. The, the interesting thing with PGS is if the we don't we do not recommend that you transfer the abnormal embryos. That's why PGS is, is good because you get the results before you carry the pregnancy. So the genetic counselor takes you through the implication of transferring those embryos. But if the person is already pregnant and does NIFTY, it's a difficult decision that the couples are faced with. Let the, if the NIFTY test comes back and the baby they are carrying has chromosomal abnormalities. So they have to decide to keep or not to keep. The other option is to prepare for 
on how to care for the child that is coming. But with PGS, you don't necessarily have that challenge because you these embryos are strained before they are transferred into the woman. So you have the option of transferring only normal embryos. So in essence, when you, the, the, the aim of PGD is actually to prevent abnormality. So that's, that's the aim of a PGD. But if you're pregnant spontaneously and there is an abnormality, when maybe lifting is done, then you have um, the option of terminating the pregnancy or going through with it, which of course will not be, not be advised. Um, but that's um, a decision that someone will have to make us through counseling. Um, also, uh, the first speaker talked about, this is from John Aloba. The first speaker talked about some genetic malformations or errors. Is there any factor responsible for the errors outside? Um, sorry. Is there any factor responsible for these errors side the mentioned um, environmental factors? Query such disease, drugs usage, etc. Did you get the question? Uh, let, maybe we should ask um, Damidola to answer this for us. Genetic malformation or errors, is there any factor, maybe any other factor responsible for these errors aside the mentioned um, environmental factors? So for genetic errors, mainly we start from inherited. Um, most of the time passed down from the parents, either from the mother or the father, or sometimes both of them carry the trait and then they jointly pass it on to the offspring. It could also be environmental, as mentioned. It could be due to exposure to some forms of chemicals or substances. It could also be due to age. Age is also one of the major, major, major factors. It could also be due to age um, because of the way reproduction is. With age, there could be errors in the replication um, process also. It could also be due to drugs, um, yes. Um, it could be due to congenital abnormalities. Probably the mother was exposed to something or a particular drug during pregnancy. So there are a lot of factors that contribute, but majorly most of the time, what we would mostly see are uh, inherited diseases passed down from mother, father, to the offspring. Okay. Um, yeah, someone says, thank you for this nice presentation. I'm curious to know what happens to those embryos whose results come back unfavorable. I think that was answered. Um, or can Dami just take us through that also? What happens to the embryos whose results come back unfavorable? Well, th there's a process uh, whereby we involve the parents of the embryos in court and we try to obtain their consent for discard. Um, it is not our recommendation to have those embryos transferred, um, of course, with the implication. So they sign a proper document and consent and we have them discarded. At this point, we would say probably it's safe in court because you would say that um, embryos, life has not begun um, at that particular stage. So they are not alive. I'm putting a quote to that. So usually they are discarded. Oh, sorry, I was missing. Is Nifty available at Nordica? No, no. Yes, Nifty is very available at Nordica. And can you just say something about it? How, when do we need to do the Nifty? Okay, so the Nifty test is basically a blood test. So once the woman is from her 10th week of pregnancy, from the 10th week of pregnancy, you can walk into Nordica and get a Nifty test done. We'll take the blood sample, send it for analysis in another two to three weeks the result comes back and you have the result. Okay, so, and also um, sex selection can also be done, sex um, determination can also be done through, through NIFTI. You can, you can know um, the sex of your baby from 10 weeks. 
from the, the, the mother's uh, blood sample from what uh, um, Victoria said and also Nena. So just, just um, a sample from the mother can detect the sex of the baby from 10 weeks of pregnancy. Also, um, Immaculate Clement also says, talking about XY chromosomes, please, what is responsible for a male child behaving like a girl child? Ah. Would that be an abnormality? It's on a bubbly scale. <laughs> um, who am I going to call? Damilola. <laughs> <laughs> you, are the, you, are the, you are the experts in this. <laughs> Why will a male child be behaving like a girl child? <laughs> uh, uh, well, this can be a tough one, uh, but <laughs> there'd be a genetic basis to it. The only thing I would say from the genetic angle is that there are some times um, where we have what we call um, a mafrodism. Um, whereby a particular human being can have um, both male and female chromosomes together, but that doesn't necessarily translate to behavior. It might translate to some physical characteristics um, that might suggest that the person also carries the traits of the other gender, but not exactly in terms of behavior. So genetics might not be able to explain that. Okay. Um, for parents in waiting, this is from any other for parents in waiting who might need IVF and PGG, how much would you suggest they have saved before they can embark on the process? Tough one. Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe so Um, That is a tough question. Like my MD, we always say that any couple that can buy a car and do IVF. <laughs> so IVF is relatively not too expensive and um, it's affordable. You have to save towards it to do, have it done. All right. Um, thanks for the presentation. This is from Talatu Idris. It's, is it possible that for all samples taken to be faulty? And if the answer is yes, what is the way out for couples with such? Damien. Yes, it's very possible for us to have that, which is why, first of all, we start by saying that you should have a certain number of embryos to even begin with, so that we can maximize the chances and um, avoid such situations from happening. Um, but can it still happen? Yes. Um, when such happens, um, the risk is that there will be no embryos for transfer. We reevaluate the cycle and we move on from there. All right. Um... Kem is asking, um, my question is, can the pregnancy be terminated during the procedure? This procedure, I'm not sure the procedure you are talking about. Can pregnancy be terminated during the procedure? Nena, do you want to try and probably give an answer to that? For PGS, there's no pregnancy. PGS is preventive. So we don't even get to the stage of pregnancy because we have seen the embryos that are abnormal and we advise you not to transfer them. But for Nifty, because the woman was already pregnant before the test was done, she would have to, is a decision the couple has to make, make after they've been seriously cancelled, whether to terminate or not to terminate, depending on how much they can take. Okay, I think, I think people are getting this mixed up. You know, with pre-genetic testing, what happens is that you are pre you want to prevent um, such problems from happening. So you are pre-testing. You pre-test before you transfer. So it's the embryos that are free from any chromosomal um, abnormality that you're going to transfer. For instance, it's just like someone who has three girls and you want a boy, and you have done pre-genetic uh, diagnosis and you don't have a boy from that embryo then there is no need for you to transfer. So there is no pregnancy here. But in cases where people are pregnant already, there is, there is an pre ongoing pregnancy, and you now do a nifty test to, 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 to see whether there is any abnormality, then that's when termination of pregnancy can come in. Because already you are pregnant, you are just checking whether you are free or you are not free. And that's for people who, who, who are screening, 
you know, the, the, the embryos are screened. So you are waiting for the results. You get the results and the embryologist will now advise you the embryos that can be transferred. The ones that are free from any um, chromosomal um, abnormality. Those are the ones that you can, you can transfer. The ones that are not free, of course, you will not be able to transfer them. So there is no pregnancy at all. So we should not get it mixed up. Um, cost implication. I think for people asking for cost, maybe you can just send us a mail, then we can discuss this. Um, can a genotype screening be done also? This is Stella to Idris. Can a genotype screening be done also? Um, Nena, that was your, uh, no, that was um, Victoria. Yes, with PGD, you can do genotype screening. That's basically the reason why you're, there is already a known and genetic disorder. The couple are both AS or AS and SS. So you want to screen the genotype. So that is what PGD does. Before transferring the embryos, we screen the ones that are genetically normal. That is the ones that are AA suitable for transfer and the SS will not be transferred. Thank you. Okay, from um, Aminat Mohamed, um, can couples who are seeking for multiple conception with specified sex go for PGD? Um, Amy? Can couples who are seeking for multiple conception with specified sex go for PGD? Um, for PGD, uh, we don't determine the number of embryos that implant into the uterus. As much as possible, if you have more than two embryos that are normal, after the result has been reviewed, yes, we can transfer two embryos because they are blastocyst transfer. But to know how many of those two is good, that were implanted into the uterus, we don't have control over that. So it's a matter of probability. You can have one, you can have two, sometimes three. So we don't determine the number of fetuses. So it's just the sex or, or the 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 type of sex that you are looking for, if you have it from the embryos that have been screened, but the number that will get implanted is beyond anybody. So you cannot predetermine multiple conception. All right, do we have questions from Facebook? Maybe we should, if you have some questions. Um, then I would also like to ask, uh, maybe Dami can just give us some, um, like some things to, talk about generally from PGD, PGS, what you want us to know from your own end. Damilola. Okay, so um, I think it's just to make the distinction because I see the, there seems to be an overlap of what pre, prenatal testing is and what PGD is as well. Um, so what PGD Wafford does of doing is to in quote, play with the embryos or work on the embryos before implantation. We pass, pass a big, a very big benefit um, in terms of the fact that prenatal diagnosis is comes with its risk, that the CVS and the amniocentesis. Um, there's also the risk of losing that pregnancy. So. What if the baby is normal and you've gone through an invasive test and um, it comes with the risk of miscarriage and that baby is lost? So PGD takes away that risk. And um, as well as the trauma, like Nina mentioned, of having to terminate if possible. So I think holistically, we've taken, uh, we've covered a lot of things today. Um, if you have more questions, we'll be more than happy to address them and answer them. Um, fortunately or unfortunately with PGD, we need to use IVF. We get a lot of people say that, oh, I'm not infertile. Why are you asking me to do IVF? Um, because that's the only to work with, um, allows us to work with embryo laboratory. So um, essentially IVF is necessary. But there's also, it's also subject to the success rate of IVF. So uh, um, the age of the woman comes in into play. There are a lot of things to consider. But um, at the end of the day, it's usually very fulfilling. 
I mean, there are many, many testimonies to call from, especially when it comes to genotype. We've seen, we've helped a lot of couples through very tough journeys that has ended very interesting and very good. And we, I dare say that we're proud of some of the stories. Thank you, Dami. One question just came in now from Martin Jofa, and I'm going to address, um, send it to Dami too. Is cell-free fetal DNA in maternal serum, same as the nifty you talk about at 10 weeks pregnancy? Yes, um, so um, nifty, unity, there are a lot of names out there. Um, they are basically non-invasive, we call them NIPC. They are basically non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, which is fantastic because we only get to work with the maternal blood and try to extract the cell-free DNA that you just alluded to, uh, the fetal cell-free DNA, and make diagnosis of what the fetus can be. So yes, it is. That, that's the technique. That's what the, the, the test, that's what it uses. So what we offer is the nifty and the unity, depending on whether you want to check for sex or you want to check for genotype abnormality. All right, thank you so much. Um, if, um, do we have, okay, I think, um, okay, Urubuenga, Kesi Bubo, good presentation. Uh, please, what is the minimum cost for the procedure considering the fact that the majority of our clients are low income earners? Hmm. <laughs> is that Kesi Bubo? <laughs> that was. <laughs> Um, well, I think I think maybe you mentioned that also that if you can afford a Chikumbo car, you can afford um, IVA. But don't forget that all these things are they are premium. You know, it involves technology. For instance, the samples are sent abroad. You don't expect them to be cheap. You don't expect them to be cheap because they are not done here. It's not something that we do in our laboratory. We do part of it in a laboratory and we send the other part, the other part is done abroad. And of course, sending and bringing it back, the procedure itself and all that. So it's not, it's not a cheap procedure anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world is not a cheap procedure. Um, is PGD more expensive than IVF? Baby. Thank you, Ma. Definitely PGD is more expensive than IVF because if we want to say convention, because we do PGD alongside IVF, that means if you are doing PGD, it's a premium like my clinic manager mentioned. So you are doing something outside the normal IVF. So you know that you're going to pay more than those doing ordinary IVF. Okay, how reliable is this please? How reliable is the, well, I don't know the one you're talking about, um, because we've talked about PGD, we've talked about NIFTI. So I don't know the one you are referring to, how reliable. Um, so maybe I should, that's from Matthew. And let me also add this one. Is PG associated with adverse fetal outcome? Let me send this to Damilola to answer both. How reliable is this process and uh, is PGD associated with adverse fetal outcome? Okay, so in order to address the reliability, the process itself, the PGD process itself, that's the genetic process of selecting normal embryo. The accuracy is as high as 99, as, as um, alluded to by Nena, is as high as 99%. However, I'll bring it down by saying that because we are using IVF, it is now subject to the success rate of IVF. Now I'll, I'll make this illustration. A 30 something year old woman uh, using her own eggs with IVF has a success rate of um, about 40 to 50 percent. Whereas if you combine that with PGS or PGD, PGD will give us 99 percent of that pregnancy if it becomes pregnancy being normal. Either we are looking for normal male or normal female, or we are looking for normal AA or um, carrier AS baby. So it's subject to two things basically but in terms of the genetic analysis itself the process is as accurate as about 99 percent to take on the adverse effects um no pgd does not um in any way there hasn't been any evidence that pgd 
um, confers any additional adverse effects on the resulting baby whatsoever. That the baby will have a, some sort of abnormality because PGD was done? No. So far, we do not have such reports. You're muted, ma'am. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, does the, this is also from Matthew Joffa. I'll just take that as the last one. Does the mother need further diagnosis in like um, CVS to confirm the finding from cell-free future DNA in maternal serum? Um, Dami Lola. In some cases, yes. Um, we have some cases whereby the NIPT or the NIST, the unity that we do can come up to, because it tells us the result in probability. It tells us that the risk of the pregnancy that you're carrying to be affected with a particular disease is low or is high, is moderate. And we almost always say that, um, especially when it's not low risk, for example, if it's moderate risk or it will tell you that it's high risk, we almost always say that you should have that with um, CVS and not, um, you shouldn't make an irreversible decision without doing like the confirmatory test, which is the CVS. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know whether we have uh, questions from Facebook so that you know. Um, See from um, okay, no new questions. I think some of the questions here also have been answered. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, where can we access the services in Nigeria apart from Abuja? Yes, also we have in Lagos, also and in Asaba. Yes, we do PGT. Yes, in all our, in all our clinics. Um, thanks for educating on this topic, Mogris Chirobo. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, on this note, I would like to say thank you to everybody who joined this program this evening. And um, I also like to call on um, our clinic coordinator, Amy, to give us a passing word. Then we can round up and, um, and have a beautiful start today. So, Amy, over to you. I will, I will start by saying happy nurses week. Great nurses. Great. Yes. Um, on behalf of the Nordica Fertility Center, the nurses and the entire management staff, we want to appreciate everybody. I appreciate most especially my MD, Dr. Abayomi Ajayi, for always giving us the opportunity. If not for COVID, we usually meet at our Ikoi Center. And then we have this one-on-one -on -one interaction with each other. I appreciate you, sir. I pray more grace to your elbow in Jesus' name. And also, I'm appreciating the speakers, Mrs. Nina Okoro Dixon, Mrs. Victoria Ubo. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And then it's been very impacting. I also want to appreciate everyone that have joined us online, on Facebook, on Zoom. I appreciate you for your time. Even though you are, some of us are in the comfort of our home, but we've given out this time to also partake in this and I'm sure you've really gained a lot. And um, I hope that you find this um, session very interactive and informative. And I do hope that when they want, they want, when the pandemic is over, we come together once again to have another brainstorming session. Once again, I say great nurses. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening, everybody. And um, also, um, if you still have some questions, you can send to us at um, info at nordicalegos.org. You can send your questions at any time. We will be um, glad to answer them. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And um, I want to wish everyone um, a pleasant evening and um, the rest of your weekend. Enjoy it greatly. Have a fabulous weekend. Thank you.